The Trail from Hope, Chapter 8 Damn it, Dad, where are we going? I shouted. He kept driving for a moment, then looked over at me. Back of the road. They're going after your brother. Why would a group of pirates be after my brother? Why would they even be going that way, I thought. The landslide had blocked the road leading east out of town years ago. In fact, now that I had thought about it, I wasn't sure how the men had even gotten into our town. We should have heard them coming down the road and passing by our house on their way to town. If they had somehow cleared the roads of tons of dirt and rock, we would have heard them that morning. There was no other way into town. But there were more pressing matters. What are you talking about? I yelled over the roar of the engine. Who's going after Nick? I saw Bob, was all Dad said, before pushing into the clutch and shifting gears. Jerking the old truck and making the engine scream as he picked up the speed on the road. I was confused at first. Bob? You mean Bastard Bob? The man you ran out of town years ago? Yes, damn it. Her dad said as he slammed the brakes to take a sharp turn. I saw Bob in one of the trucks that passed us before we got into the general store. I wasn't sure it was him until I heard him on the radio. I remembered hearing Gladstone on the radio, but I was not sure what it had meant at the moment. Bastard Bob is back and he's heading to our house right now because he wants revenge, he yelled as he tried to get the truck back up to speed. My mouth dropped open as I tried to take all this in. Nick was all I could get out as I looked at him. He simply shook his head. I looked at the road and reached up to grab the oh shit handle in the truck. We, I stammered. We have to get there. Again, he just nodded his head and pressed the gas pedal a little more. We had to get there to save Nick. Bob had somehow come back after all these years. It may or may not have been specifically to get revenge, but now he was trying to get it after what my father had done. Now that it was his fault, he had just been trying to protect his family in his newly adoptive town all those years ago. I thought back to the story and wished that my father had just killed him and his sons. He had the ability. I now knew that. But he had not, and now my brother's life was in danger. I gripped the AK tightly in both hands. I looked next to me and grabbed the shotgun my father had taken from the man back at the general store. I racked around and put it back down. I started to look around the truck for any weapons that might be available. We might as well be ready for all hell to break loose, I thought. Then I remembered the pistol that I had picked up with the belt. I pulled the pistol. It was a Glock. I dropped the magazine to ensure it was loaded. It was full. And there was a round in the chamber. I stuck it in my belt. My father looked at me and nodded. I was not sure why he was nodding, but it was probably just because I had taken his lessons over the years and had at least acted like I knew what I was doing. I didn't, though. I was not prepared for any type of battle, but I would do any and everything to protect my little brother. I would kill anyone that I needed to to protect my brother. To protect my family. Then I thought about Mr. and Mrs. Johnson and started to tear up. I quickly wiped the tears on my sleeve so as not to let Dad see me cry. This was not the time for it. I looked over to him, and he reached over and gave my shoulder a reassuring shake. He took his arm away and winced. That's when I noticed the blood on his shirt sleeve. 
Dad, how bad is it? I asked as I lifted his sleeve. Not bad, it's only a flesh wound, he answered. Besides, we'll be at the house in just a minute. So you need to listen to me. I was looking around for something to make a bandage as Dad started to outline a plan that he had just made up. When we get close, we are going to go out and move into the woods. I'll stay on the left side where the house is, and you move over to the right across from the house. Make your way up the hill to that small clearing where you could see the front of the house. Shit! I had been able to cut a piece of my sleeve off to wrap around his wound. We came to the curve before the mile or so stretch leading up to our house, and as soon as we turned the corner, Dad yelled and the world around us exploded. The glass seemed to explode all around me, and I dropped my head into my lap and covered it with my hands. Then the truck came to a screeching stop. Stay down, my dad yelled. I could do nothing but scream. There was gunfire and glass from the windshield that was raining down on me. I don't know what was going on. It was so deafening and terrifying. Ambush, my dad yelled. Stay down. I could hear bullets striking the truck. They made a metallic sound clink every time they hit the old rusty truck. I was scared and figured this was it. This was the end. We were dead. Then there was silence. I listened for a second. I wasn't sure I was dead. Is this what death was like? Couldn't be, I thought. The ringing in my ears hurt and I could feel the small cuts from the shattering glass on my hands and my face. Looking at my hands, there was blood on them. It could have been from my face, ears, or hands themselves. Then I felt a strong hand push me. They're reloading! Get into the woods now! I heard a muffled voice say. It was Dad. Ambush? Shit, I have to get into the woods, I thought. Then I snapped back into reality and grabbed my rifle, opened the door, and tried to step out. I was stuck. The seatbelt, I thought. Damn! I yelled as I sat back in the seat, unbuckled myself, then stepped out of the truck. By this time, the air was again shattered by gunfire, and I just threw myself to the side of the road. I was hoping for a hill I could roll down, but there was just a ditch. I hit the ditch hard and knocked the wind out of myself. But the bullets hitting the ground all around me was my biggest concern. I tried to get small in the shallow ditch, but I felt exposed. I tried to burrow into the wet leaves and dirt that lined the bottom of the trench, but it seemed like I would be shot at any moment. Then the gunfire seemed to be directed in a different direction. I did not hesitate and took the chance to stand up and run into the woods. As I reached the trees, bullets started to hit the ground around me, and the trees started to spew bark and splinters. So... I just ran. I ran about twenty yards before my foot caught a root and I stumbled and failed. I crawled a couple more feet before I sat back against a big oak and tried to catch my breath. It was once again quiet, but then I heard some yells coming from the road. I tried to listen over my heavy draws of breath. I wanted to be quiet, but the adrenaline was once again surging through me and my heart was pounding in my chest. The gunfire erupted again. It was not directed towards me, but the other side of the road. Dad, I thought. I stood to my feet and readied my rifle. I looked down to check the rifle and noticed I had gotten mud on the AK. Frantically, I wiped at it with my sleeve. Luckily, the mud wasn't too wet and came off easily. Then, taking a deep breath, I slowly inched around the large oak until the truck came into view through the trees. The truck was about 20 yards from where I was, and smoke was billowing out from under the hood. I didn't know where my dad was, but figured he was probably on the other side of the road in those trees. That's why there had been fire directed at me, and then somewhere else. I tried to look further down the road to spot our attackers. I hadn't even gotten a chance to see them since I had been occupied when they had opened up. Through the breaks in the trees, I could see the top of the truck about 50 yards down the road. 
I had to take those guys out, I thought. I slowly pulled the rifle up and aimed down the sights toward the truck. I couldn't see anyone, so I moved ever so slowly around the tree to the other one, hoping to get a better view. I knelt beside a somewhat smaller oak and now I could see almost the entire truck through the foliage. There was a problem, though. It was empty. My breath caught in my throat. The men who had ambushed us were now somewhere off the road. They were in the woods with us. And I didn't know where. That scared me. I didn't know if they were on my side of the road or the other. There was no gunfire and it was just, again, quiet. I strained to listen. But there was still some ringing in my ears. I held my breath in hopes that I would be able to hear something. Anything. That's when I heard it. The leaves started to crunch from directly in front of me. On my side of the road, I froze. I was not sure if they had seen me yet, so I tried to slowly bring my rifle up. Just then, I saw movement in the tree that I was hiding behind seemed to shatter into splinters, so I just ran. Bullets followed me as I dodged through the tall, thick oaks, sending splinters in every direction. I had to get away somehow. I wanted to dart to the right and across the woods towards my father, but I didn't want to allow these men to get back together so they could outnumber us. I figured that my best option was to split these men up in territory that they didn't know, and take them out one at a time. So I instead changed direction and turned sharply to the left, running through the trees away from the road. I tried to run both away from the road and the attackers, so I think I was running southwest. I wasn't sure, but it didn't matter. I needed to get away from the shooters and flank them. After a few minutes, I'd only heard yelling and the gunshots had stopped. I had run up a small hill to get to a little ridge. So I ducked to the other side and started to run parallel with it, to the east to get behind whoever was hunting me and to get closer to the house. Nick was still in danger, and we were still about a mile away from the house. My father was somewhere in the woods on the other side of the road, and I knew that he could fend for himself, but right now, I was in a fight for my life. I ran for a few minutes, then cut straight to the left, north towards the road. I should be about half a mile behind the pirate's truck. No longer could I hear anyone following me, so I ran in hopes that I could surprise them on the road. I was nearing the road and could see through the branches when again, I heard some yelling and a few gunshots. The gunshots seemed to be close to me, even though I had traveled some distance. I'm sure the man who had been chasing me had lost me and was now heading this way as well as Dad and anyone that was chasing him. I was a little worried, but continued towards the road. As I got closer to the road, a boulder came into view. As I seen this boulder every time I had walked this road towards town and even climbed it when I was younger. It was about six feet tall and about eight feet in circumference. It had probably been there for a long time, having fallen from the top of the mountain at some distant time in the past. Now it sat there as a perfect ambush point. I scurried to the top of the boulder and laid flat on top of it. I got my rifle ready and waited. I listened to the sound of sporadic gunfire from the other side of the road that steadily got closer. I listened to this for a minute or so, then I heard the truck. It was coming from the direction of town. One or more of the pirates had probably gotten back in when they couldn't find me. Now it's coming towards me. The gunfire on the other side of the road started to get even closer and now it couldn't be more than a hundred yards from where I laid atop the boulder. It sounded like two separate people shooting pistols at each other. Dad, I thought. Rifle fire and pistol fire sounded different and I could tell that two people were shooting at each other with pistols. Shots only rang out every few seconds, followed by some yelling for some reason. I had to take my mind off this because the truck appeared around a slight curve, only about 150 yards away, and was coming towards me with the engine whining and smoke puttering from the tailpipe. 
I was all that was between these men and our house. I knew that there was more already there, but I had to take care of these intruders first. Besides, Nick was smart and had most likely hightailed it to the rocks at the first sign of danger, I told myself. The truck came closer, kicking up a cloud of dust, and I aimed at the driver. The truck was bouncing on the road, but, but I had been through enough today. I was not letting that truck pass me. I aimed and focused on my breathing. I took a slow breath in and focused on the driver, making sure my sights were trained on him. I then let my breath out slowly and evenly and squeezed the trigger. I was still breathing out slowly when the rifle kicked and the bullet left the barrel. The bullet seemed to make contact as the truck swerved a small bit then jerked back. I pulled the trigger again, sending another bullet towards the truck. At that moment, a man came out of the woods to my right. He was backing away from the tree line and firing into the woods. The truck's tires squealed, but it was too late. The truck hit the man that came from the woods. With sickening contact, the man flew down the road towards me. His body seemed like that of a rag doll and he slid and rolled along the road before finally coming to a rest just right of the boulder. I ignored him and put the sights of the rifle back on the truck and squeezed the trigger until the magazine was empty. The noise and concussion of the rifle started to make my ears ring all over again and started to give me a headache, but I couldn't stop until I was out. Breathing heavily, I watched the bullet-ridden truck as it slowly sputtered towards the boulder I was laying on. As it got closer, I could see there was a driver and a passenger, both dead. The truck hit the boulder with a light touch and came to a stop. I heard some leaves rustling to my right and swung my rifle in that direction. My father was there. He had a pistol in his hand and had that look in his eyes again. I lowered the gun in my hand and just looked at him. He looked down the road and back at me before I understood. Nick. I said, as they turned to look down the road. Dad then went to the truck and grabbed a rifle and a couple of magazines. Grab his pistol and any ammo, he said, mentioning the man that had been hit by the truck. I ran to him and grabbed the magazines that were in his belt. I did not see the pistol that he had, but he had probably dropped it when he was hit by the truck. I stood up and my father was running past me. He doesn't have a pistol, I called after him. Doesn't matter. He called behind him as he continued running. I just started running after him. We were running towards our house, now the ambush had slowed us. We had to get Nick. I started to run as fast as I could and quickly caught up with Dad. Pace yourself, he said through even breaths. We still have some fighting to do, so it would do no good to exhaust ourselves. Hearing this baffled me a little. How was he not exhausted, I thought. I could barely clench the rifle and my whole body felt like it could give out at any moment. And now he wants me to conserve energy? I have no fucking energy! I yelled at him, as best as I could in my state. I was tired and angry and wanted to let him have it, but I was too tired. And then Dad stopped. He looked up the road when I turned. I saw dark black smoke through the trees and rising up into the late afternoon sky. Dad started to run again, but slowed as we neared a bend from which we should be able to see our driveway. Gun at the ready, he checked the trees on both sides of the road as we inched closer. I was close behind him and finally we were able to peek around the bend. I let out a defeated sigh when I saw that there were no trucks in the driveway or on the road. There were no pirates at our house. They had already gone.
My dad took off towards the house with speed, as I slowly ran up to the break in the trees in which our house sat and turned up the driveway. I dropped to the ground, entirely spent. I looked at the ground for a moment with tears cutting past through the dirt in my face, before falling into the dirt. Finally, I looked up. The house was on fire, though it was starting to smolder in some places. The porch, along with most of the left side of the house, was burning. Or smoldering. It was mostly just a carcass of the house it had just been a couple hours ago when my father and I had left. The barn to the right was completely burnt down and was now just a pile of charred timbers that were just giving off smoke. The yard was torn up where trucks had done donuts all through it. The sheep pen was mostly empty aside from a few dead goats and chickens that had been run over in the chaos. I looked around at the destruction of our home and just felt lost. Then I looked up when I heard something. It was my dad running from behind the still burning house. He looked over at the barn and trotted over without seeming to realize I was even there. He tried to sift through the rubbish, but it was still hot and dangerous. Was he still looking for Nick? If Nick was not there, maybe he was okay. A sense of hope washed over me like a cool water, and I forgot how tired I was and stood. My legs were a bit wobbly and every muscle seemed to ache, but I didn't care. Nick was fine. I was sure of it. He was probably up in the rocks. Nick, I called out, my voice sounding small and hoarse. I coughed and tried to form saliva in my mouth. Suddenly, I was very thirsty. Nick, I called again. Nick, where are you? I trudged towards the wood, calling out for my brother. He had to be out there. He was too smart to have been surprised by those and would have known better than to stay in the house. I could feel it in my core. He was alive. Our dad had taught us contingency plans in case anything happened. He had taught us what to do in the event of a fire and made sure we knew where the fire buckets were. We had plans for if something happened to him. He even made sure that we knew how to get down in the root cellar in a rare event of a tornado. In the case of the house being attacked, we were to run straight out the back door and into the woods, up a small trail and to an outcropping of rock where we had guns and ammunition stored in a watertight cooler. The rocks. That's where he was for sure. <laughs>